it's Big Corgan with the Smashing Pumpkins, and you're watching my Ask Anything fan chat for Nikki Six. Let's see. The first question is from Vladislav in Ast... This is funny. Astkram, Russia. Sorry. I'm sure they're mad at me there. Why is the new album called Monuments to an Elegy? Um, usually, um, the album title just comes to me like a, almost in a dream, and, and I just kind of go with it. And then I'm asked a million times what it means, and I honestly don't know. Um, but if I'm guessing, it seems to have to do with something kind of end, like an ending. Uh, not the end of the band, but the end of a particular era. And in a way, um, the music and the way I look at the music, I don't know. That's the best answer I have, and I know that's a terrible answer. The next question is from Eric McLantern of Los Angeles, California. What is the most memorable, fun song and the most emotionally impactful to you on Monuments to Analogy, and why? Um, I'd say the fun song is uh, the last song, Antihero, uh, which is classic, like, girl uh, next to you in a car driving down the highway. I got Tommy Lee banging the shit out of the drums behind me. Uh, thank you, Nikki, for the, for the loan. And uh, most emotionally impactful, I'd say it's the song Drum and Fife, which uh, I would dedicate to our soldiers, uh, many, of who, uh, many of whom have come home and uh, are facing kind of a strange prospect, having been you know, through so many tours, and, uh, and they really need our support. I'm, not, I'm a political person, but I believe when it comes to soldiers, that's a, not a political issue. Uh, they need our support. So I think in the back of my mind, I was thinking a lot of, about a lot of the soldiers who are still fighting in their minds, but uh, either back home. Uh, here's a question from Blake Krochuk of New York City. Monuments to Analogy is by far the shortest Smashing Pumpkins album. Was this done purposely, and if so, why? Yes, absolutely. Um, we got frustrated. Uh, the last album, Oceania, was 60 Minutes, which we played live on tour. And people like the album a lot. I mean, it got good reviews, all that kind of stuff. But you can just tell that people are not listening to the album with any kind of depth. And at some point, you start to say, well, is this the album's length? Is it the material? Or is it the way people are consuming music these days? So we thought, well, at least change something. And maybe if we did less songs and really put more energy into those songs and try to do the best we can do with a limited number of songs, in this case, uh, nine songs over 33 minutes, with the quality of material be just that little bit higher that would get people excited and maybe get them to listen again. And that seems to be the case. And so that was, I would say, a good decision. Um, from Navajone of Grantsville, Utah. How long has it been since your last album, and what is your favorite song from that album? Uh, the Pumpkins put out an album called Oceania a few years ago, uh, and I would say my favorite song for that album is probably a song called Pinwheels, which we uh, continue to play live. Uh, if you get a chance, I don't know how many people know about that album. It, like I said, it was really well received, um, but maybe didn't get too far past the fan community because it didn't sell like you're supposed to sell things. You know what I'm saying. Um, Zach Taylor, Watertown, Wisconsin, asks, During the Oceania tour, you mentioned a possible set of fan shows where the Pumpkins could brush off some oldies for the most hardcore of SP followers. Are those plans still floating around? I don't care what you'd play. I'd fucking be there. Well, thank you, Zach. Unfortunately, there aren't enough of you, which is part of the problem with a fan show like that. Um, I think we'd like to be in a position where we'd have a few more fans. In essence, we have a little bit more momentum behind the band before we do something like that. Uh, I would propose something like we pick one city a year, maybe say we're going to play seven shows in that city and play a very uh, non-hit-driven, deeper catalog uh, fan set. I think that would be something we'd really get into. And maybe the upside for us, because, uh, because of the dynamics and the way the business works, is maybe we film that. And maybe that's the way we have an upside in that. And then the shows don't have, we don't have to kill people on the ticket price and stuff like that. Cause those dynamics can be tricky because for the, for the band to play a show like that, that's probably about six weeks of rehearsal. And you can imagine that eats up a lot of time and, and energy. I'd love to do it. Um, I'm lucky in that I'm 47 now and I can still sing all the songs in the original keys essentially. Um, but you know, I don't know how much longer that can last. And I'd like to, uh, revisit some of that material in the right way, seeing as we're not going to do the uh, go out and play Siamese Dream album tour type deal. Uh, Matt Pethenbridge in Western Australia. Since the band's reformation in 2007, what has been the biggest challenge and greatest accomplishment of each writing creative process along the way? Zeitgeist, Original Tear Garden Sessions, Oceania, and Monuments to Technology. That's uh, quite a, a question. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is to get to the band accepted as a contemporary band. Um, as strange as that sounds, there's a delineating point where the whoever the crowd is out there says, this band, oh, they have a new album, oh, this is new music, and oh, the Pumpkins is an old band, so somehow the music is only relevant in terms of how it is viewed in the past. I, in essence, does it remind me of the past? And if it doesn't, I don't want to hear it. 
Um, and I've asked that question publicly. I got in a lot of trouble uh, comparing myself to other people of my generation who I felt were getting the benefit of the dat that doubt, and I wasn't. Uh, I, I've always considered myself an A songwriter, and the fact that my songwriting was not being viewed in depth really kind of bothered me. Uh, you're not supposed to talk about that stuff in public, but there I'm talking about it in public. So to answer your question, the spirit of it, uh, your biggest challenge and greatest accomplishment in each writing, I don't know, that's a long answer. I don't know if that's fair to, for everyone to hear. Um, I would say with Zeitgeist, it was trying to find the original psychedelic bent of the, of the band, which we didn't, and so the album became very metallic. Although I like that, uh, most people don't like that about that album. Uh, the original Tear Garden Sessions, for me, it was really about um, rekindling my spirit as far as making music. In essence, either retiring from the very public part of my musical life or uh, reinvigorating myself so I want to keep working, and, and here I am. So obviously I did do that. Um, Oceania, it was really about trying to see if there was a deeper well by which um, the pumpkins could operate out of in a balancing point between what people's expectations were and... Um, what, it, what it is I wanted to do. And I would say I didn't do that, and that has a lot to do with my mythology, where we just thought, fuck it, we're just going to make the best pop music we can make and punch everybody in the face. And if we get a little bit of momentum, then we can go back to being the art band that, that I've always wanted. Uh, without that, um, you are the tree that falls in the proverbial forest, and at some point that gets really old. Um, Matt from Australia. Uh, what balance do you strike in self-editing and holding bad songs that may sound like classic Smashing Pumpkins but don't fit the individual vision of an album like Monumentology? That's a fantastic question. And the answer is uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, there were at least two songs on Monuments to Analogy at some point you know, that were sound like they would have been written in 1994. And um, we kept them off precisely because they sound like they were written in 1994. I really am not interested in that. Um, because ultimately you're going to be compared and you're going to be compared against people's memories and you're going to lose every time. So no matter what anybody thinks, it's not going to work. And I know that. So off they go. And so maybe you'll hear them someday in some reissue. And you can tell me I was wrong then, uh, but by then it'll be too late. Uh, Doug White in Mundelein, Illinois. Did you use any new stomp boxes, pedals, or other outgear, outboard gear on Monuments Technology? Actually, no. We used pretty much just vintage Marshalls straight in. No pedal effects almost all the time. It's just the album is just raw power. Uh, Jason Matz in Washington, D.C. Without even touching on anything remotely sexist, do you feel a, di a different dynamic playing with all males for the first time under Smashing Pumpkins? Actually, that's not true. We did play as an all-male lineup uh, circa 2009 or 10 with my friend Mark Tulin, who was uh, a member of the Electric Prunes, if anybody knows the band, pioneering psychedelic band. So uh, Mark... Uh, Sturmer from the Killers is actually the second male bass player of the Pumpkins, so your question uh, is incorrect. And no, um, I've been asked this a lot through the years, and uh, it's a it's a it's a difficult uh, question to dance through. Personally, I find the question of females in the band and or males in the band uh, disingenuous because ultimately that's assuming that that plays. Uh, uh, a role in my decision-making process as a leader of the band. It doesn't. I'm a musician first. And I used to say in, when the doors were closed um, to whoever was in the band, male or female, we're all musicians, and in that we're equal. And uh, I don't think women in music should want to be treated different because ultimately that's some in, innate condescension. Uh, a great musician is a great musician, and if they belong there, they belong there, and that's where it ends. Anything else is more like what you bring to the table in terms of personality. If your background plays into that, great. If it doesn't, great. It doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, you got to get it done musically. And those things really don't get it done musically. Um, Jason Shesky in Toledo, Ohio. A lot of fans, including myself, seem to be the most pumped for the machinery issue in 2015, as well as your work post-2000. What can we expect next as far as reissues? Anything from Zwan, Chicago Kid, Future Embrace, and Zeitgeist. Um, I just want to get the machinery reissue done. Um, it'll end my commitment as far as to EMI. Uh, it's a lot of work because we're going to re remix everything and try to make the original album all over again. Uh, fans know what I'm talking about. Uh, and if we can get past that, then maybe there'll be reissues of the other 2000s albums. I actually own the albums, and they're all coming back to me. Uh, so I'll have total rights, and I can do with them what I want. So who knows? Maybe I'll just sell them through my uh, Madame Zuzu's website. Uh, Cody Butler in Stratford, Connecticut. How was the first year of the Pumpkins when you didn't have a drummer or a bassist? What would you recommend that people in similar situations do? Actually, we had a lot of fun uh, without a drummer. Uh, you know, you just pressed the button and it played the same beat every time, and you didn't have to deal with the meltdowns or the not showing up for rehearsal. Um, 
As far as people uh, that are in that similar situation, I think you make the best of your creativity. Um, sometimes when you don't have somebody there, uh, whether it be a bass player or a drummer or a guitar player, uh, in my case, uh, when I was in uh, my very first band, I was the only guitar player, so I had to play a certain way to make a bigger sound, a la like Edge and uh, U2. So you take, you take the uh, adversity or the situation and you, you turn it into creative opportunity. And our last question, James King of Hull, UK. For the 2016 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame introductions, will the original lineup be reuniting? Uh, first, you're assuming that we're going to get in. Uh, second, you're assuming that there's an original lineup to reunite. And three, you're, you're assuming that I'm going to be there. So let's just deal with that when it happens. God bless. Thanks, you, Nikki.